Well, welcome everybody. This is a talk on the art and healing power of the mandala. I'm delighted that you're here because what I really want to explore, and I was thinking about the sort of three questions of what is a mandala, why does it matter, and how do we use it? And a lot of this took me into the question of really understanding ourselves as a technology because many of the questions we ask reach a place where we can't go any further. And that's why the, the technologies of the imagination take us into the mandala and the symbolical language, sacred geometry and anchoring the imagination. In our time, our technology is usually keeping us in motion. So a lot of people are having a hard time concentrating, having a hard time following things because we don't have stability. And all of our meditative techniques and all of our ancient techniques were much more about how do we create that which allows us to find stability so we can focus our energies and from that place of focus move back out into the chaotic world and still have a type of inner peace or an inner sense of inner self. And this is one of the things and great gifts that I, I feel very strongly about because many of the, the revelations I've had about the wheel, about the mandala, weren't something that came from a type of conceit, but much more the outcome of a creative question. You know, how do we make sense of our condition? Nobody left an operating manual. What is the point? And I realized that that was not an answer that could be given. It was actually, as Rilke says, that we must live the question. And so my art really is the outcome of having lived the question. But my art is also the outcome, as with these evenings, of people like ourselves realizing that many of the questions that need to be asked have to be asked intimately. If they're asked publicly, they're shouted down. They're not given time to grow because people are embarrassed by them. They're, they feel too vulnerable or too, I don't know. And the last thing an adult wants to admit is they don't know something. And this really asks you to be innocent. Can you step into a relationship? Can you allow yourself? Can you give yourself permission? So a lot of this tonight, and I think this is very important for our time, is about boundaries. If we understand the boundaries, then we can understand where we start to give ourselves permission creatively, imaginatively, and how we don't leak. In other words, we understand what tool to ask for what question. And that's why a lot of the centering techniques, the meditative techniques, when they move to the visual, are saying, you know enough. And this is why the hieroglyphic language, the picture language, is our most ancient language. Because a picture can't be interpreted one way. It's like music. It can be allowed to be freed through each individual, but it will be always that much different. But if we don't look at that as a problem, but actually as something wonderful, or like jazz musicians together, we realize that that riff reveals the truth in a way that no one individually could actually know. Because the story really wasn't about one individual. It was about all individuals in a singular sense coming together, really like musicians or knights or storytellers, to say, I don't want to tell your story. I want you to tell your story. I want to tell my story. And this will allow us to realize what the mandala is saying, because they are all picture stories. Now, this is the Sri Yantra. And why I wanted to bring this up as well is, do you see the geometry? Now, feel this as well as look at it. Because much in the West is we're taught to see and think and feel optically. Because a lot of our uh, really inquiry into the mandala, into ancient forms, have been through a religious, spiritual, historical, analytical, psychological lens. They've really not been through a creative, imaginative lens because, again, that's too subjective for many. It has to be provable. But this is where we start to mature. It says the most interesting parts of your questions are where you realize they're not answerable with the language you're used to. In a way, you'd say, I've studied the piano, I've studied the notes, and the piano says, listen, you're only going to understand what I'm about when you play me. You're going to realize my function was not just the notes. It was to create a structure in you that finally gave you permission to see where we could go together, but to realize that you're an instrument, so you're not going to be torn apart. And that's what the key here is. And this is where the Tibetan Book of the Dead, so many of these texts are about, I don't want to overwhelm you. This is a relationship. I might be an instructor, but I don't want to tell you what to do. I want to help you unlearn. I want to unteach many things that you think you have to be beholden to, but you don't. And that's really what the creative imaginative wants to say. You know, the accountant in you got you here. The bottom line that said, I'm not this and I'm not enough in myself and there's something wrong with me. Well, maybe that's the human condition. 
then that wasn't the problem. Because that feeling of inadequacy is what in turn created the alchemy where we had to bring something out of ourselves to counteract that, or as Emerson would say, to create compensation. And that's why our relationship to the Sriantra is not to begin to look at it to say it is this or this or this, it's to say it is this and this and this. Because then it starts to act as a tuning fork. And if we begin to understand that we are living trees, not the next moment in time, then many of the things we're trying to access are like a tuning fork. They're trying to awaken within us. This is where I use theater and embodiment very much as the sense of a character. You don't play a character from the outside. You create the conditions to dissolve your resistance to this other psychology that is very real and very true. And like a shapeshifter, you allow it to be expressed and yet you do not go mad. You do not become convinced that you are this other character. You have expanded into this other consciousness and realized you are that as well. But you can choose to return home to you as yourself and realize that was a performance. I'm going home now. This is what these tools are asking as well. This is one of the problems I have, because I spent 17 years on the tarot, and many people go, oh, do you believe in that? And I said, if I have a hammer on my desk, would you ask me if I believe in the hammer? You'd, you know, I'd say it's a tool, it has a function, but in and of itself it has no specific anything. It's whatever I use it for. And that's the same thing with symbolical systems. When people go, oh, it's full of the dark energy. No, it's not. <laughs> It's full of whatever energy you put into it. That's the key. <laughs> That's what the watchers are. This is the Book of Enoch. If you are malevolent, I give you malevolence because that's what you filled me with. I just give you what you give me. If you want to unriddle the miseries of your life, start adding in that which you like, not just what you don't like. And this is the key to understanding the technology of the mandala because it allows us to move into other brainwaves, other areas of what I call ambient perception, where you're allowing yourself to be inspired. Inspired is not directional. It is what you might say is oxygenating. We find ourselves able to hold a larger sense of the possible. And that is what creates interesting performance, interesting life, and interesting love affairs. And this is why we also see this relationship. And I think this is very important because in this mandala, we start to see the relationship to all the different characters. But note that they're all at once. And this is an important part of seeing an image where everything is happening simultaneously. Because in the Western tradition, we started to isolate, create portraiture, create isolating the figure in time, certain timescapes. But when we look at our cathedrals, we look at our ancient techniques, they were all about inclusivity, meaning that I want to tell you a story that doesn't have an ending, that actually takes you, and when you come back to where you began, you start to look at me just a little bit differently. This is why when we begin to see that the archetypes, the gods, the goddesses, the energies are saying, why I am human for you is that I remind you that you are these passions, you are these qualities, you are composed of all of these things. And that's what we understand in the spokes of the wheel of the tarot. We understand the mandala. I am this and this and this. I am continually at this relationship to that which is devouring and holding the key of life, of life and death simultaneously. And yet I can hold all of these things at once. What does that allow us to do? It allows us like a tree to stand in the center of the wheel. We can see the wheel turning, but we allow ourselves as an environment to not be trapped by the environment, in a sense swept into it, but stand in relationship to it. That, if you use a theater analogy, is an actor understanding I'm playing my role, you're playing your role. I'm not swept into your role by the passion we share between us because the play's the thing. And if you think of the psyche that way, it says that when you stop over-identifying with what archetypes you like and don't like, and start to understand the relationship that you are all this, or with the tarot, that you are all of these qualities, like the keys of the piano, then the instrument starts to reveal itself. And I wanted to take us back to one of my, my favorite beings, which is Hildegard of Bingen. <laughs> and she was a remarkable uh, being. She was everything from a dramatist to an exorcist to a sphericist. Um, and she it was uh, in the t 11th century and 12th century. 
but she was also a spiritist. Why this is important, we'll see some of her artwork. And we start to see the mandala. And the mandala is a word that means orb, it means wheel, it means sphere. But any time in art, any time in symbolism, we see the wheel, it is about inclusivity. I want to show you these things as a simultaneity. So here in the simultaneity of the four seasons, of the qualities and conditions, Hildegard is showing us that we exist within this earthly plane as the, within the condition of all these things. We live as an orb within an orb. We are part of a greater body and being. And this is why Christ, as we'll see, the embodied man, we see the angelic with the red, the angelic mind opening in the crown chakra, if you see, to the informing principle of Christ or Christos. Because the story she was saying is that it is inclusion, it is not exclusion, that the light at the top of the mind is the living tree that includes all of the stories, not just the stories that make sense to us in these eyes of time, but through the root system of the human form on its journey of becoming divine in her system. And I think this is one of the most telling relationships to the mandala and to the story of the orb, but also to the story of the symbolism that we so often don't understand because of the way we've been conditioned to react religiously or spiritually. And when we can look at it, as I like to think of it, much more, as you would say, from a point of view that I want to see where this inspires me. I don't want to see where it makes me judgmental, but actually these are ideas and stories that have inspired great art, great thinking, great possibility. So let me not think my job is to reject them, but maybe to look more deeply into what the hidden meaning might be. And that's when we go from a line, <laughs> it's this side or that side, to a curve. We allow our thinking to become spherical. We allow our examination to be multifaceted. And that's the key here of, as she says, do you see the Christ is not in one ring, but in all rings, like the tree. And if we begin to understand this even as a type of physical of the brain, the two hemispheres and the corpus callosum, that the greater Christus, the greater light of mind, is not in any one ring of time, but that actually the ratio of our journey, and this is the mandala, is creating a human form that can hold the story that in the rings of all of its journey, do you see this greater informing presence of the greater ideal that within you is that which is worthy. Within you is that which is worthy of salvation. But if we realize what she was saying, it was not simply you alone, this is the human seed, this is the human orb. And that's why when we look here into the oculus, the eye of God, we start to realize that here she's telling us about the heavenly, uh, choirs about all of the conditions, but all of our, our stories help us in meditation and in journey to begin to see that this isn't to tell us a story that you have to believe. It's like the great cathedrals. Anything that is of beauty says, I, last thing I need you to do is believe me. It's like a great love affair. The last thing I want you to do is think it's about belief. It's about worthiness. It's about the wor willingness to show up, to say, where do we go next? And that's the key here because her story is that when we remember that we are composed of all of these qualities and conditions, then once again the light at the top of the mind, the oculus, informs our vision, not with the energy of these eyes alone, which navigate the world, but this greater vision of a greater love that is the human tree. And that's why this way of thinking helps us really get into the technology of the mandala, because it says, I'm trying to gently move you into the sense that when you're self-reflective and you think it's not, I want to turn your lens around and say, it is. I want to turn you away from trying to convince the neighbor that his politics are wrong and bring you back home to your heart to say, maybe it's not about politics. Maybe that's a chatter that is keeping you distracted from how do I grow something of value? How do I tell a story that is more loving? Because maybe it's not to convince the many, but to look at history and say, it's those that have attended to that that have always allowed things to change, and I use that, allowed things to change. And that's why when we look at, and I, and I felt so strongly to, to add this mandala, the, the rose window in Notre Dame, the great lady, because this is where we see, coming in the 13th century, of course what we see in fractals and in mandalas, but we're also realizing, no, 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 this is part of our pattern body. 
And that was the key to the restorative sense of the cathedral. It said that, as we see on the outside, she says, do you see wheels within wheels? I have different elevations. But my truth, and the deeper truth of what I am the expression of, is a greater beauty that says you cannot look at me ever the same way twice. So I want you to enter my mystery. Because look at me on the outside, then look at me on the inside. Look at me on the outside, <laughs> look at me on the inside. And understand those are just different conditions. But if you look at me with an imagination, you realize I'm trying to have a conversation with you. Stop looking at me just this way or this way. But maybe <clears throat> this way and this way. And that's what allows us to finally, as I say with baby steps, just move away from it. It has to be this or this. And that's why a lot of the question, even going back to Robert Flood and the Mirror of Nature, and I wanted to show you the, the relationship here uh, really 400 years ago in hermetic philosophy of we see Sophia uh, uh, holding the chain down to the monkey on the earth, and we see her holding uh, to the tetragrammaton, the Hebrew name of God. But we also see that everything is going on simultaneously. So essentially, in this simultaneity, the animal, the qualities of the earth are not wrong. They are that which is being connected, you see, through the chain, to her, through love, through the lunar crescent, through life, through birth, through that which is the womb, not of one of us, but all of us. This is the key to Sophiac knowledge, meaning I am the knowledge of generation. If your knowledge is of exclusion, you will not get beyond the monkey with calipers. You will be, what is it uh, William Blake said, uh, Newton's sleep. Two-horned reason, Newton's sleep. <laughs> but then we see the Tetragrammaton. But this is where the name of God, and we must remember in Jewish mysticism, and this is very important, God sealed creations, not creation, with many names. And that helps us understand that what we're looking at, because this is what the mandala will help us see later, is that creation opens uniquely following its elements, its particular signature, and that this is what is also important, which is that the rose, we think of the Rosicrucian, and we think of the bee attracted to the rose. If you think about philosophically, how do you talk about that? Listen, do you know how the bee is attracted to a rose? You know that sort of, hmm, that's good? That's part of philosophy. Because if you can't find that, then you're probably following the phantom of reflection. You're trying to be important. You're not trying to be intimate. This is the key again, because an operating system is trying to get us to say, I want you to come to the heart of the flower. I want you to hold, and what is a flower? Because people don't see this either. Oftentimes they think it's a symbol. A flower is not just a symbol, it is life. And this is the key to the mysteries, it's the key to the tarot, it's the key to the unconscious, it's the key to dreaming, which is if your questions are based in life, I can open from that seed. If they're based in fear, I must draw from that, in a sense, those confines. I have very little to work with. <laughs> so I'm going to scare the heck out of you. And, and this, this is... is <laughs> yes. And isn't that beautiful? It is the rose that gave honey to the bee. Think about that. Beautiful. And now we go to the Maya, who took the Bacton seriously. But the, the journey of the Mayan calendar, why I think this wheel is very important, why the 13 Bactun were very important, why the 2012 ending of the Mayan calendar were very important, was that their entire cosmology was based on rounds, on wheels within wheels, and that like an interacting clock, that it was about finding the moments of alignment, almost like tumbler locks, wherein all of the qualities and conditions are able to align. This is why the step pyramids we're talking about, that we build from the foundation of enormous time, to, because we're actually building, and this was the Bacton. And this helps us understand the cultivation of a consciousness. Because for 347 or 360 years, each Bacton was a period of time where we would say a particular god or a particular influence was affecting the civilization. But if you think from a gardener's perspective, you'd say actually it was the influence of a certain growth hormone, so to speak, to pull out of those conditions. Like you hear in ancient times, we walked with the gods. Well, that's a very different condition of your psyche when you're with your parent than when the parent leaves. But this helps us understand that we didn't arrive here. And this is what the Maya were trying to teach us, is that we are not historical. We are your roots. And that when you stop looking this way, and this was the end of the Mayan calendar, it's very telling, and you stand this way on the vertical, you look down and realize 
you rise out of the questions we could ask that you could not, and you rise out of the questions that you could ask that we cannot. But we created the foundation for what you consider your linoleum world, but it's the gift of that which is not based in this tethering to these ancient cosmologies, which is a very interesting thing to think about when you think about it. Um, and that's why the mystery and revelation of the painting of the Phoenix arise, and that the Hopi say that the knowledge of our sacred DNA is woven into our baskets, and that what the Phoenix arise really revealed, I felt, looked like Indian baskets. They looked like Indian headdresses. And I always point out that this property that this revelation in painting has happened on is Shumash sacred land. And I feel that the ancestors are trying to say it is about witnessing that the roots you grow from were not about getting away or actually saying, I'm not part of that, but the blood we rise out of, and I mean that literally, is saying, bear witness that you haven't grown to get away from this. You've actually grown to make something of it. So make a home not just for yourself, but like upstairs and here. Make a home for the library. Make a home for all the conversations across the ages that said, you know what, I know you want to blame me, but I didn't know either. Because I had to go and ask that question. I had to be the bad guy in that one. I wish I could have been the good guy. But without the bad guy, there was no catalyst. You know, and this is where we really start to honor, like an acting company, God, you really convinced me. I thought you were wicked. But it was actually an archetype saying, no, what I taught you was a martial art. I'm telling you what to pay attention to. I'm teaching you how to navigate the real from the actual. There are real things, and that's what these structures help us understand. They get at archetypal structure, meaning that once we understand how we're woven, we can trust it. If we understand our relationship to it, we can say, where can we go together? Because the discovery, and that's why this relationship to my painting here, Phoenix Arise, which is that we know a much larger painting, but we start to see what will happen in the journey of creation. I point out, and this is an essential key, paint is our first language. The first thing we did was put our hand in paint and touch the cave. A painting was not, in a Western sense, to illustrate anything. It was much more what we find in an indigenous sense. In an Eastern sense, it is an act of communion. It's that quality that allows us to literally connect. So the paint on the cave wall was to feel the cave wall, to trust the relationship. This is why the bison that you see that mold into the cave itself and so are literally a sensual act. They are literally a sensual act. And this is why oftentimes we have so removed ourselves, become so clinical, that we don't really understand why what is being said here could only be said in this language. Because what we're going to see is a, is a mandala created from a painting. A painting is our primary language. It is a fixed object, meaning it is not something that plugs into electricity. This is important for our technology because it says that when you have things that do not plug into anything else than your curiosity, then we're going to have a relationship that doesn't take you away from yourself, but actually brings you into yourself. And when you discover that, like a tree that has roots, you go, well, I'm way more interesting than I thought. I don't know if anybody's ever given a performance where you walk away going, how did I do that? Or you write something, you think, who wrote that? That's this other quality that's saying, you just got out of your own way. You realize you're much more interesting. You just think you're this. Because <laughs> you go, oh, look at what I wrote. Oh, I, I didn't write that. I, that's way too brilliant. I'm just, I'm just little old yeah. me. You know, and a lot of this is saying, enough of that. Enough of the apologizing. You're not impressing anybody. Step into it. Step into the relationship with that deeper love, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the key. Because here, when I created this in card form and I drop the cards, we can see it creates the yoni. It creates the larynx. And it creates what I realized was a fundamental philosophical story. It says that you are taught fractions and incompleteness, math and time and distance, and you are not there yet. But your ancient Greek philosophers, your Egyptians, your Maya, we didn't teach those things. We taught, you are trying to draw these, you are trying to bring them in so you align with them. So we create the conditions for the imagination to understand not fractions, but wholeness. And that's why this is a fractal iteration of a painting, but also a primary mathematical truth that the reflection of wholeness and wholeness creates the possibility of birth. 
That's the quality of, we'd say, the masculine and feminine creating between both of them, or our mother and father, which is neither us, but our, who we are of. And that's the philosophical basis of what this then revealed, which was the DNA double helix and the holographic weave. If we begin to understand why this signature is so important, it says, I am a fractal mathematical iteration of creation. I am not a symbolical representation of that. I am the <coughs> literal embodiment. I come from a painting. And I started to think of the painting as the act of love, the act of devotion, the act of concentration. This helps us in understanding the mandala, that sense of I am not trying to paint something I can figure out, but I'm having a relationship that, that with that which takes me deeper and deeper. And why this fascinates me is that who knew this would happen? And when I turned it this direction, you start to see this ancestral face with the slit eyes and the slit mouth of the alien or the ancestor. Can you point that out? Oh, yeah, this, this, it's very, I need more light. It's actually, it's here. You can start to see these two eyes, two eyes and it's over and over again. You make these the two eyes and the mouth, two eyes and the mouth. Because in a fixed fractal mathematical geometrical message, it's showing us that what we consider alien is actually a tree that forgot it has roots. So anything deeper than our human experience we think of as alien. Um, but that's why, going back to what creates this, which is creation and original, it helps us understand origin and the idea of, of an original, meaning from uh, that of origin. This is my work on the tarot and on forbidden fruit. This is the delicious knowledge of Eve. Why this helps us understand the mandala as well is that we're going to look at the cross mandala and we think, well, what is the cross mandala? And we can see on the left, when I, when I was working on the sun archetype, I was very uh, awakened by Leonardo's Vitruvian Man. I thought that that was really a brilliant way of talking about this relationship. Do you see the, 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 the horizon and the embrace, the sense of the focus of as above, so below the macrocosm, microcosm. Man is a universe in miniature. This is the knowledge of the structure of the black and white of things. Now what's a very important point here is that this is a structural uh, sun. It talks about the heart, the structure of the sun. But then the next quality is the knowledge of Eve. Now here we see the apple. We see the same position, but we see the third element, which is the yoni, meaning she brings together the possibility of birth. This brings us back to the seed, do you see, to life. That's the key of the symbolism of the apple, meaning that my gift of life is not a gift given to one, but to all. The journey of the difficulty and responsibility is not given to one, but to all. And that's why Joseph Campbell's so helpful, because he says, listen, if you get over thinking these are religious, these are actually mythical structural qualities in us that are trying to say, how do we make sense of Cain and Abel? He's around me all the time. How do I make sense of the God of war? How do I?" In other words, they're always with us. And the genius is, how do we make sense of it in our context? And you can say that's the art of our journey, that we're always faced with the same conditions, the same black and white. But how do we make something out of it? And that's why she says, and this will give us the key, the fourfold mandala, this relationship is that the womb, the apple, life is about the questions that we pose. This is why my magician is not a magician in my tarot, it's a magus, it's a seed bearer. Because the one question in everything is, are your questions based in death and fear, or life and possibility? If they are based in death and fear, you are not free to enter the arcana, because this is an unwise seed you are planting. If your questions are of love, of possibility, and to me this is the transmutive and transformative heart of every anguished poet and artist and writer and dreamer and lover and mountain climber and athlete that ever strived to transcend everything they felt they couldn't do. And they reached beyond themselves into that which breathed life into them. And life said, you are capable beyond your wildest imaginings. And that's why I wanted to show you how this will create first and foremost a uh, cross. But I want to show the relationship of the line mm. of above and below. And we're going to start, this is to the right, and then I'm going to show you the square that happens on the left. Because here we'll bring about and start to see the energetic shapes that start to emerge. And here we see the X, the cross, mm -hmm. the quaternary, 
This helps us philosophically understand why the Pythagoreans revered the Tetractus, the four. Because they said the quaternary is not four incompletes, but four qualities of creation creating the square that allows air, earth, fire, and water. You see? Hot, cold, moist, and dry. All of these quaternary traditions to create the four seasons, that which creates the condition of the cross we are on and in. And that's why as we go back to the other side now, feel how the energy will shift. And this is just finding points of coordinates. And what is profound on this, look at the archetypal shape. It's actually this. It's the same shape. Do you see why that helps us understand what this is about, like the grand attractor in, in astrophysics? It's saying once you understand that it's not making it up, you're composed of these patterns, and it's not you recognizing it. Quite literally, it's the pattern in you recognizing it, waiting for you to catch up with yourself going, oh, oh, I can do that. Because nothing's going to be imposed. That's the sense that, you know, you're not going to climb great heights until you're willing to say, yeah, I'll do it. Because nothing wants to encourage you to take that which drives you mad. We're mad enough as it is. <laughs> we don't need help. <laughs> but this is also the great key to the setting creation emotion. This is what is so profound and really gets at the key to the mandala blossom. But this helps us understand in a pictorial form, again in sacred geometry. It says, I'm going to take a picture. I'm going to take the golden section. I'm going to take the rectangle. And I'm going to repeat it. And in each repetition, I'm going to take you on a journey. I'm going to remind you that Pythagoras said God geometrizes, and you forgot to ask, what is it that God geometrizes? And Pythagoras would go, oh, you think it's number. When I said all is number, it wasn't about number. It was this truth of archetype, being, and creation. That number is inherent within creation. Mathematics is part of its structure. But mathematics is not its meaning nor can mathematics reveal its love. That is its structure. That's like, I mean, and this is one of the great things to creation is can you fall in love with me deeply enough to be responsible for a relationship? And that's why as the wheel turns, we see the umbilical serpent, this sense of the connecting wheel. And this is what I had seen in my, with, and my friend's daughter slid this card up and I thought, oh my God, because the serpent then starts to show us what we find in this, uh, the phoenix cycle of coming full circle because in the mythology and the legend of the phoenix bird of immortality and rebirth is it returns home and it builds a nest. And, and that's what we see, a nest in feathers, mm -hmm. just as in the story. But this is a picture. So this isn't me saying, oh, consider this. I might be imagining these things. This is me with my jaw on the floor going, I, uh, okay. <laughs> explains Pythagoras, gets into Plato, and it stabilizes what the Egyptians meant by the golden section. That the blossoming of creation was not the movement through time, but like a plant, it was the utilization of time as duration in order to create a structure that could finally hold its greater operating system. And that's why in the story of the nest, as we know, once the nest was built, and you think of the nest as the heart, as the home, we finally return here. Once it was built, it erupted into flames, and as it does, we'll see it actually erupts into flames. And as I pull them out, we start to see that it's not random flames, but what it will reveal is a blossom. So once again, it's, <laughs> I feel like there's a part of consciousness going, here, let me draw you a picture. <laughs> you can't actually argue over this. You can ignore it, but you can't say it's not there because that's the nature of sacred geometry. That was the point of Luxor. You could say, hey, we Egyptians didn't know what we were doing, but it's here. It's all around you. You're the ones that have cut yourself off from this ambient wisdom. We're just waiting for you to let it out again. And that's this phoenix blossom, and that spontaneous creation, infinite mandalas, blossoms and suns, and that's where we start to see this story of the blossoming of creation. Now look at this, and if you put the 3D glasses on, mm -hmm. this really becomes amazing. Mm -hmm. Because you start to see something that's being suggested that is very intriguing. It says, and this is why when I talk about dreams, because this came directly from dream experiences I had 
is when I was working with the mandalas all the time, I was building a mandala every night before I went to sleep. Then I started to realize that I'd find myself in a dream, and let's say we, you, I'd be looking at you, I'd see faintly, I'd see the mandala, I'd see one of the mandalas <coughs> behind us creating the context, in a sense the harmonics of that dream. Then that dream would end, it would go back to the phoenix, it would choose another point and unfold with a different blossom. As if to say, when you understand a holographic portal, you don't build things to go anywhere because there's no there there. You create a stable platform with which you can create the conditions to open, to gather, and to return. And that's why this is the story of the, uh, the imagination and the mandala is the imagination. This, the eagle nest revealed itself. Uh, a fellow was telling me his spirit guide <coughs> was an eagle and I started to see the nest and feathers. And the agape uh, mandala, which is uh, enormous, it's that one there. That was out to 360 cards, and this is 180 cards. But this is also where you really feel this sense of they look like Indian baskets and mm. Indian headdresses. And the sense also of when we see the center of the mandala, you see like an, eye. an eye. You see nothing. In other words, that what's unfolding by the rectangles, by the, the golden section, is that it's actually unfolding around no thing, like the pupil of the eye. Mm. And that's the key here, is that it's saying we're not born into time, we're born into creation. And Jung was very smart, and I, I did this with the accent, so I'm going to do it again. <laughs> Helps. We know from experience that the protective circle, the mandala, is the antidote for chaotic states of mind. That was a terrible one. Um, but the, uh, the God image within us expresses itself as the mandala. Jung was very helpful because he really understood the relationship of the creative imagination and suggestion and the need to allow ourselves to understand that in an operating system of the human condition that if we utilize the right keys these are the right instruments to calm us down because they create not just a temporary calming they create a, would you say a sense memory a quality that we can return to that we can actually how do, how do I feel when I feel this way? How do I feel when I feel calmed by the mandala? Let me return to that feeling. The body remembers. We are in time. The body is like a tree. It's the cumulative memory of all of those qualities. The God image within us expresses itself as the mandala. Think of that. Mm -hmm. The blossom within us. The blossom of a flower. Because what's a blossom? It's not one petal. It's the utilization. It's the unfoldment of all of its petals. Mm -hmm. And that's why, if you think of calming the upsets, it's when we create the circle, we create the container that allows us to put things into their proper relationship. This is also why when I put the DNA that this creates together, I want to go back and forth between these two. Just feel the difference energetically. And. I'm going to hypnotize you a little bit. <laughs> sure. Because I want you to feel in your bodies the shift. Because you can see, can you feel how you're shifting back and forth? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you feel where you're feeling it in your body. You're feeling it in here, right? You're feeling it in the perceptual body. Now, the body is adjusting, it's actually perceptually moving from registers, yeah. octaves. And we don't see it. And this is the importance of a mandala. It's that you can't see your deeper wiring any more than a tree, tree can see its roots. But as you start to hold these qualities, look at what happens when we go from this to this to this to this to that. Wow. And that's what I kept, when I was working on the slides, I kept feeling this sense of being impacted by these energies. And I started to realize, as with music, if you understand notes and notation, it's not, it's not just one thing, right? It's, it's like trying to create a condition that is creating a tonal field. But here we move, and this was also key to the mandalas, that at the heart of all of the mandalas is a sun, S-U-N. Now this helps us understand the archetype of strength, the sun, the solar center, what this means. It tells us a very ancient truth. It says that you are a star embodied. So you enter time at a different trajectory than she does or he does. But that you will open because of that trajectory. And we think of astrology would say the same thing. 
you're going to open with a particular lens, a particular blossom of the world. And what's really beautiful about this is it's saying this is the heart, the sun in each of us, that is the light in each of us. And as we see with this Indian basket, we start to feel the sense of the medicine wheel. And the medicine wheel, if we think about the healing of the tribe, the tribe says, if you're sick, I'm sick. We are a tree. We are one. This is why we celebrate in the circle. This is why we have totem poles. It is, I do not grow out of, out, out of no context. I grow out of my ancestors. I grow out of my roots. And as I understand this, then I understand in my weave, in my basket, in everything, I am always talking about that through inclusion, we create that which can contain, because that's what a basket does. I don't, I'm wondering, and probably everyone understands it, that all of these mandalas, because not every mandala has the sun in the center, but all of these mandalas are the mandalas made by the painting, the car. Yeah, this one, one, yes, yes. These are all from this one painting, which is important to keep in mind, because you would not see this in that. Do you see? Now think of ourselves, right? We would not see this primary source in our own blossom. We would see our geometries, we would understand our unique conditions, but we would not see this primary source because to us it would seem like just a sliver. I mean, it would, it would be, and this is part of the great realization of what is happening now with the fifth world that the Maya talk about. They say this is the age of the, in the prophecy where we enter the fifth world the age of flowers. And I read that, I thought, the age of flowers? But when then this happened, it made wow. sense. Because I thought the age of flowers sounds like roses and, and petunias, and the age of flowers is actually saying, what if this flowering is the flowering of human consciousness? Mm -hmm. That as an instrument, we are realizing that as above, so below, in the black and white, in the structure, in the form, we can finally hold trust in the stabilizing truth that we are in this condition which allows us finally to stand upright to trust the imagination, not as an escape plan, but as a plan to be inspired. And that becomes then the holographic blossoming of creation because it says, you will blossom and are blossoming a whole and holy relationship with creation unlike anyone else's. And that's the key to the artistry of humanity and what it means to be human. And the phoenix arise creating creation's design brings us Again, full circle. Think of that. Everything bringing us full circle. You've been on a great journey away for a very long time and you're exhausted. You can't forgive yourself and you don't know what to do with the armor. How do I do it? What do I do? It says, let me tell you, maybe do it in degrees. Downstairs, hmm, understand that that structure keeps you in Kansas. You can enjoy this relationship like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz and understand it's not to get away from the people you love. It's to understand behind the difficulty if the imagination is not something we are lost in, but something we go to, to return from, then we understand that our full circle would be to return home as the loving expression, not just of our own humanity, as the outcome of all humanity. And that's why I want to share, and we can turn down the lights for this, Dave Wexler's film, uh, and then we'll bring it full circle, just be finishing. But I wanted to bring this, because he created a fractal film of this painting, and just see where this takes you.
I just want to say, actually, a, a, a real nod to Dave Wexler. He created that. I called him my my Luke Skywalker. I felt like Obi Wan Kenobi going, Luke. I didn't know the universe could look like that. <laughs> because he took Phoenix Arise. He took the painting, and and he that is all one painting. Wow. And I started to realize that if we understand that as a philosophical premise from the one, the many, from the one infinite expression. But this brings us back not to the illustration of something, but really through art, through creation, the sense of coming back home, coming back to the truth of the phoenix. And that's why the last slide is this story that the phoenix arise reveals we are an art form. We are not born into time, we are born into creation. We are each a phoenix, a unique blossom of creation, whole, holy, holographic. Each of us wears the robes of our sacred DNA. Life is our inheritance from the ancestors. Let us be worthy of them. And this great and difficult and noble adventure in consciousness, art, and meaning called being human. And I feel very strongly about that. If we understand that we're part of something that is bringing us full circle, bringing us back to the heart of the mandala to say that you now are the inheritor of all of these qualities and conditions. I've had great results from the use of these cards that when we understand it as a primary technology, it really is, as all technology, a tool that means it will open according to how it is engaged. And that's why a lot of the meditational tools that I use this for is to create either a cross mandala or to look at where the image attracts me, and then to create a mandala, because in the creation of it, like when you see creating a sand painting, or in Tibet when they create the, the great uh, Kala Chakra, you know, that is the part of the process, we're so used to thinking, well, it's, uh, it's about getting it done. And this is, no, it's about the process of bringing it into being. It's not about speed. It's about using everything as a type of meditative tool because it teaches you in a way, it's almost like a mentor saying, slow down. Mm -hmm. Your very impatience is what we're working on today. And so that's why even with the cards, I found that because that, that you're dealing with, with patterns and geometries, what it's doing is helping the pattern recognition part of the brain to speak a language in you, which is also what does trigger the dream state and triggers also the relationship to, as Jung said, that the, uh, trying to create a structure and a conversation. Because if you think about this, putting the cards down, I did not mean to be a master of the cards, but I've created tarot cards. I've created a card that creates mandalas. So I guess some part of my soul said, I want to give you a tool that, like anything, like a piano, is up to you and how you play it. But if you understand the, the fundamental function, art tries to remind each of us you are a thing of beauty. You are an art form of creation. I can only reveal your greater truths when you understand this. Because in this understanding, you're willing to enter me, not as something you are going to take, but something you are going to seek to become worthy of. And so that's the key of the mandala. That's the key of the, man the blossom, is follow where the imagination takes us. Start trusting that the tools themselves want to have a conversation with us. But like the music going, hey, we went some places together, didn't we? Mm -hmm. And we go, yeah, we did. Great. Because we spoke different languages, but I realized your intelligence was not less than mine, but far greater than mine, because it was patient enough to wait for me to say, I allow you to have a conversation with me. And I really think that's consciousness. I just want you to show up and be curious. I want you to have a conversation. I'm not interested in your opinion, and you shouldn't be either. You're more interesting than that. So thank you very much. And, uh